Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. As the people were in expectation, and all men questioned in their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he were the Christ, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove. And a voice came from heaven. Thou art my beloved son, with thee I am well pleased. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have indeed blessed us with the gift of your son. You have revealed him in your word. Lord, help this not to be merely a intellectual knowledge of him and his presence, not merely a historical Jesus, but Lord, help him by your spirit to be Lord of our lives and empower us to do that which you have called us to do by the gift of the spirit. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Now i got to make sure I keep uh, track of time. That's one of the things about preaching at the 8 o'clock service. Boy, you're just really kind of hemmed in. So we, we, we kind of have to get to the, to the heart of the matter kind of quick about it, right? You know, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was talking about um, last names. Or I'm sorry, talking about um, uh, ideas. Uh, you know, the idea that, uh, that you were going to have the job that your, your father handed down to you. And this is especially, of course, true of men. The idea that, uh, you know, you were going to stay in the, the family business. And we were talking about this when we were uh, talking about Jesus being in the temple with the, with the rabbis and, and, and wondering, you know, I must be about my, my father's business. That was, you know, just a, a couple of weeks ago. I often tell people that Christ was not Jesus' last name. I mean, I, mean, I think people sometimes think that. Jesus Christ, that's not his last name, can we please? I mean, it's really not. But in a lot of ways, I mean, think about the development of last name. I guess there was a day when people didn't have last names. I mean, you know, they just said John, you know, the guy around the corner, or, or Bill, or, or Susan. And that was it. I mean, and, and, and of course, the idea that you were identified with your last name became what it is that you did. I mean, I guess that's why we have, you know, last names like Goldsmith or Silversmith or just Smith. You know, how many Smiths do we know? A lot of them out there. And if you go back and look at German names or, or Swedish names or, or any, the last names, if you go back into the mother tongue, I mean, usually means something regarding what it was that your great, 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 great grandfather did like 10 million years ago. That's the origins of last names. Because it really does have to do with our identity is what we do. Our gospel text today is, is a lot about who is who here. The word has promised a Messiah. They're waiting expectantly, the word tells us. Hey, we're waiting for the Messiah. They'd been waiting a long time. That's what the first lesson is really all about. Isaiah is addressing a people in exile. They lost so much. A lot of what they lost, though, was perhaps their identity if they were identifying more with the land than with the God who promised to be with them always, even in exile. Those who made it on through the tough times, 
realized that their identity was less about the land, although the land was still, of course, part of God's promise. And God didn't forget His promises. He restored them. But most of their identity was in the very fact that they were His beloved children. And so He was renewing their promise, reminding them of what it is that He would do with them, what He would do for them. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give men in return for you. Now I would imagine when that prophecy came from Isaiah, they didn't quite understand what God would do. Indeed, God would give one man in return for them. In exchange for the life of that man, salvation would come. And he would gather them in together from the east and the west. For indeed God had made promises. Those promises were about to be realized. Epiphany of course we all know is a word that means to appear. To make known. The first Sunday after the epiphany is always celebrated as the baptism of our Lord. A time when the voice from heaven makes it known. That Jesus is His Son. And that's significant. For the Son of God is indeed the Messiah. The last Sunday after Epiphany in our tradition is always the transfiguration of our Lord as well. A time again when a voice from heaven makes it known that Jesus is God's Holy Son. But as, as we look at today's text, in Luke's version of Jesus' baptism, it's really much less about the baptism of Jesus than important statements about who He really is. About His identity. Now you'll notice in Luke that we aren't told where Jesus is going to be baptized or where He is baptized. If you go to Israel, there's actually like six or seven different places that the tourist places will tell you, oh yeah, this is where Jesus was baptized. They really don't know. We aren't told actually who does it, although we can pretty much guess that it was John. The tradition was that Jesus, of course, was baptized in the River Jordan by John comes from the other Gospels, not from Luke's telling of this story. Now, I think it's helpful for us to understand what it is that Luke is kind of zeroing in on today in our text. For Luke's main interest is not so much the baptism itself, although that is significant for us, and we'll get to why that is in just a moment. But what happened after the baptism? For you see, the purpose of our passage today is to introduce and to begin to answer the vital question of Jesus' identity and His mission in this third gospel. And to highlight the work of the Holy Spirit in anointing people for ministry. Now, of course, we notice that there is something significant that happens here. For Jesus has the heavens opened up above Him and a dove descends upon Him. The coming down of the Holy Spirit bodily as a dove. The descent upon, of the Spirit upon Jesus was an anointing and empowering thing for His ministry on earth. Too often, I think, the Holy Spirit has become for us a topic of discussion rather than the power for ministry. The coming of the Holy Spirit does not make Jesus the Son of God. In fact, we know that from the very beginning of Luke's Gospel. From the Annunciation to Mary, the identity is revealed perhaps to a precious few, but that identity is indeed revealed 
the crowds asked of John, is this the Christ? Is this, the, is this man the Messiah? And John is clear, no, not me. His humility, his understanding of his role and his ministry is clear in his mind. I am not even unworthy to untie the sandal of that one. No, indeed, I have come to prepare a way for the one who will save us from our sins. No, our event today, the baptism, at least in Luke's gospel for sure, is to reveal to the crowds, to all of us who will come and read this text, who Jesus of Nazareth really is. The Son of God. The one whom, in whom God is truly pleased. Of course, we understand that Christmas is about the incarnation of God among us. The epiphany is about His revealing to us. Jesus became one of us to show us how to become part of Him. The Holy Spirit came to empower Jesus for His ministry to show the world what it was that God had called him to do. Both the temptation story, which will follow our text for today, when Jesus is sent out into the wilderness. And if we recall, of course, what is it that sends Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted? Leads him out of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Isaiah quote that indicates that Jesus is spirit-led in his ministry to battle and defeat evil in whatever form it appears. And that his spirit-led ministry continues after his ascension through all flesh upon whom God has poured his spirit. A lot of people ask, well, if baptism is about removing of sins, cleansing of the unclean. Why was it that Jesus was baptized? For you see, the baptism we are invited to is not only one of water. We remember that the old Adam is drowned. But it's also an invitation to become part of God's family through His Son. Jesus invites his followers to follow him, to do the things that he did, which would certainly include the baptism as a means of God's grace, of our cleansing. Water has been an important part of what it is that God is doing in the midst of his people since the Old Testament days. It was through the water that Moses took the people out of slavery, out of bondage, and into the wilderness. But after the wilderness, after the testing, indeed the promised land. For this life is a wilderness. We cannot pass through it without the cleansing waters and reminder of God's grace that we receive in baptism. But John also reminded us in his text today that Jesus would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with the purification and fire of that Spirit. So we are not only cleansed through the waters of baptism, refreshed through that event in our lives, but we receive something special. The Spirit descends upon us as it did Christ, showing us our calling Our baptismal priesthood, if you will. He commissions his apostles, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's an invitation to be part of his family, to be part of his nation. And we receive faith 
as a gift of the Holy Spirit marked in our baptismal rite. In Christ's baptism, God has chosen to reveal His Son. And we, of course, have the Word come to us as well so that we would turn to Him, turn away from our sin and witness to His love empowered by the Spirit. But baptism also has other powers for us, other meanings for us as well. For as Jesus was baptized, Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, as Jesus was, that, that, as Jesus was crucified on a cross, we too will join with Jesus in our baptism. We are baptized into his death so that we would share in a resurrection like his. We have this gift. We have the descending of the Spirit upon us to redirect us, to show us the way, to empower us in our baptismal ministries so that our identity can be found in Him who is the Word. And that Word is planted within us as we gather every Sunday, as we receive the Word made flesh within ourselves more tangible evidence of God's love and care to claim us as His own. That is our baptismal priesthood that we share. And perhaps, of course, we are empowered by the Spirit as Jesus was empowered to do His ministry. We are empowered to do ours by that same Holy Spirit. And that ministry will be revealed to us by the same Spirit. And there's so many opportunities to do ministry. So many options. Perhaps it might be delivering meals on wheels. Perhaps it might be working at Salzbacher Center. Or working with the youth as a mentor, as a guide. Helping others in their time of need. When I can remember Bob Mitchell in his last days, reflecting continually even on the ministry he would still like to do. He said, you know, I, I think I would like to do Meals on Wheels. But isn't it interesting that while he was in the grips of his last moments, deciding that he, if he were given the opportunity, which ministry he would like to do, he'd like to bring meals to people. All the while, his family being ministered to by faithful persons within this congregation, willing to give of their time and their talents and their efforts to bring meals to him and his family in their hour of need. That's ministry. And we have been empowered to do ministry of all different types, to care for our neighbor in the name of Christ. That's what the Spirit empowers us. That's what the Spirit descends upon us to do. And so when we remember our baptism, we remember that Christ has cleansed us from our sins in those, in those powerful waters. But it is not just the waters, it is the Word with the water. And the Spirit that gives us faith and empowers us to go out. In baptism, we find our own identities in Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit with faith to do ministry in Jesus' name. So we pray, of course, Sunday, day after day, not just Sunday after Sunday, but day after day, Holy Spirit, fill my heart with faith, hope, and love so that we may do ministry to our brothers and sisters so that the word and witness goes out from this body, from this community and every community in Christ of the love that God has for us all. And the fact that he wants to claim us all as his beloved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift. The gift of your son you have revealed to us. The gift of baptism. Which you tangibly remind us of your desire to cleanse us and to be reconciled with us. Lord, as we receive the Holy Spirit, let us remember this gift in faith, and help us to share it with all whom we meet. We pray this all through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Amen. Let us take a moment to reflect upon the ministry to which God has called and empowered us to do by His Holy Spirit.